Hello, I'm Kate Chabot. Welcome to SITREP, your weekly look at the big issues in defence and world affairs. President Zelensky has confirmed his counteroffensive against Russian invaders is underway. It's been a modest start. Ukraine claims it's captured a handful of villages. You can see Ukrainian troops wandering through what looked like pretty battle-scarred villages. There's not a living soul in any of these places. And you can see Russian armoured vehicles lying wrecked on the road. We'll hear more from Colin Freeman in Ukraine and Professor Michael Clark will assess another week's worth of claim and counterclaim to make sense of the military picture. Also this week, have British universities helped Iran improve suicide drones that are now attacking Ukraine? Iran is part of the axis of evil with Russia and North Korea. The fact that British universities are working with Iranian universities to me must be a security breach in some form. And we're on exercise in Sweden, where some British troops are operating in Soviet Cold War tanks. The Russians create so many switches, you'll find one switch that will be flicked up and everything stops working and you think, what 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 did that switch actually do? Zitrev with Kate Chabot and Professor Michael Clark. Mike, hi. You called it last week and President Zelensky has now confirmed Ukraine's counteroffensive is underway. Yes, Kate, we're on uh, day 11 of the offensive. This is the 11th day. And of course, there's an awful lot of uh, discussion about it all. But all of us in the analysis business are just saying we should be cautious about this. And for comparison, you know, one of the biggest battles of the Second World War for Britain was the Alamein battle. That was a big battle. That, that, That lasted three weeks. And then if you think about, you know, Bill Slim's campaign with the 14th Army to recapture Burma, that lasted nine months. You know, that was, and and what we're dealing with here is something in between those two things. It's not a single battle, it's a campaign. It's not to take a whole country back, but it's to take 15% of a country back. And so we've got to think of this battle or this campaign in terms of a, a couple of months at least. And it's too early yet to do more than outline the main areas where it is taking place. Of course, Mike, we'll talk through the big picture shortly. But before that, let's get up close. On Wednesday afternoon, I spoke to Colin Freeman, correspondent for the Daily Telegraph, who's in eastern Ukraine, near the villages that have just been liberated. Uh, These are not big places, they're sort of small hamlets, really farming hamlets, perhaps home to no more than uh, three or four thousand people. And until now, they really lay just on, on on the far side of the Ukrainian front lines. In the last, I would say, four or five days, as we understand it, the Ukrainians have been pushing to retake those villages. And um, then it emerged overnight on Monday that they'd actually been planting the flag in two or three of them. We've been driving around that area in the last 24 hours, and we haven't been able to get right into the uh, the liberated territories really yet. They're still off limits. If you look at the video footage that they've released, um, you can see Ukrainian troops wandering through what looked like pretty battle-scarred villages. There's not a, there's not a, a living soul in any of these places, or certainly not very many people. And you can see Russian armoured vehicles lying wrecked on the road, marked with the Z symbol that the Russian forces use. We spoke to um, some officials who used to run uh, those areas. They were from the local council. For the last 15 months, they've been um, operating as a kind of local government in exile. They had a kind of quiet celebration on Tuesday when they saw on Ukrainian TV that uh, their own home villages finally had Ukrainian flags flying over them. But uh, it, it's it's some way yet before um, you know anybody is going to be moving back to this, and some way yet before any of them are going to become inhabitable because about seventy five percent of the houses and most of them have been damaged. And Colin, how hard is the fighting in this con- counteroffensive? I think it, it, it's it's pretty fierce. The Russians have been pulling up quite strong resistance in certain areas. We spoke to a soldier yesterday who was with a a Ukrainian unit. He said that they retook one of the villages and he said that they encountered a group of what he described as a a Storm Z brigade, which is basically Ukrainian shorthand for a a brigade staffed mainly by convicts who've been offered a pardon if they agree to fight. Um, He said they took about 30 or 40 of them prisoner. He said that he interviewed, you know, interrogated one of these guys. He said he was halfway through a sentence, an 11-year sentence for murder. But he's now a prisoner of war, having fought for only three days 
with the Russian forces. Now, if that's true, that would suggest th- these guys are not particularly well trained and often quite new to the front lines. I also know that having spoken to this particular Ukrainian soldier, his own brigade have lost the odd person here and there, but I don't think they've lost a vast number of people in their efforts retaking these particular villages. What the picture is like further down, where the counteroffensive is going on along this 50, 70 mile long line, um, we don't really know. There are certain parts of the um, the front line where the counteroffensive is taking place, but very little information is yeah. coming out. And that has prompted a bit of speculation that maybe things aren't going quite so well there. Yeah, as you, really as you point know. out, yeah. very, very difficult to fact check exactly what's going on because you've got Impossible. Ukraine on the one side yeah. with modest gains of these handful of villages that we know about and Russia saying the counteroffensive is failing. I mean, can you at all ha- have a, an impression of what's going on exactly? Uh, frankly, no. The, most of the information we get is from Ukrainian units who are trumpeting their victories here and there. And look, here's a video of us putting our flag on the top of the town hall or whatever, um, in the areas where maybe things aren't going so well, we're not really seeing that. The Ukrainians tend not to put out anything where they're saying, you know, we got defeated here or we suffered heavy losses there. In those situations, if they are happening, it tends to be the Russians who are putting that information out. And that information from the Russian side often comes with a, a pretty heavy health warning as well. Certainly last week, we saw Russian officials claiming that something like 250 Ukrainians had been killed in the what one or two battles further along the front towards Zaporizhia. We have no real way of verifying that either way because Ukraine never comments on its own casualties. What do you think will be coming next exactly? Um, I think more of the same, really. I spoke to a soldier this morning who said he thought that this was going to take probably the best part of a year. This is merely the, the start of a battle that is likely to last most of the summer, I think, and quite possibly into the early winter. And then, of course, you have, as well as this particular front line, you've got the efforts to retake Crimea, which once again is a whole different ball game because it's it's effectively almost an island and almost cut off and will again be very well defended by um, by Russian troops. Colin Freeman, thank you so much for making the time to talk to us. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Mike, it looks and sounds from what Colin was saying like Ukraine is playing a long game here. Yeah, for sure. And it's interesting that to begin with, Ukraine began with a complete news blackout. And when this offensive started a week and a half ago, it was all Russian sources that were being used. And it's only now that the Ukrainians have started to talk a little bit about what's happening and take journalists like Colin towards the front. But of course, you get a sense of the the, the front, but you can't really work out what's happening. But undoubtedly, the Ukrainians are playing a very long game here. They know that they've only got one real chance at this. I mean, the war will go on after this offensive. But this offensive has got to work. Any half measures will look like failure. You know, slight success, conditional success will be interpreted by the Western world and certainly by Russia as failure. And Mike, does what we know about what's happened so far tell us anything about their strategy? Because these are tiny gains, aren't they? Yes, I think it tells us quite a lot about the early strategy anyway. They're they're clearly trying to stretch the Russians. They're, They're only into the Russian first and second echelons. And as Colin said, I mean, they've been picking up some of these Storm Z people, the convicts, who are the ones who are on the the very front line. They're just screening forces. Russia's best forces are still another 10 kilometers behind the lines. And the Ukrainians haven't got to them yet. And I don't think they're pushing very hard for them because what they're trying to do is stretch the Russians all the way along the line. And they're trying to get the Russians to commit their reserves to actually bother them enough that they have to commit some reserves. And then the Ukrainians will see where the the gaps are. And what I think they probably want to do is try to unbalance the Russians. At the moment, the Russians are looking pretty organized. They're certainly not running away. They're being captured, they're being taken, but they're withdrawing. And uh, I think the Ukrainians are hoping that if they can put the Russians under enough pressure all the way along the line, that their organization will begin to fall apart because they're not very they're not very good at organization once they have to move and troops morale is thought to be quite poor, although it hasn't looked so bad so far. And I think what the Ukrainians are probably trying to do is to pressure the Russians enough all the way along the line, see where the gaps are, begin to push through those gaps, and then see if they can really unbalance the Russians and give themselves some really big opportunities. But that'll be some you know, week or more, maybe a month down the line before we see that happening, in my view. 
And we were talking last week about how people might be able to cut through the claims and counterclaims and get to the truth. There's a good example this week. Vladimir Putin's claim that Ukraine has lost 160 tanks, some destroyed, others captured, including some of the newly delivered NATO Leopard 2s. Can you give us any clarity on the truth or otherwise of that? Uh, well, I can promise you that that isn't true. They haven't committed that number of tanks at the moment in, in any case. I mean, most of Ukraine's main force is still not committed. And the Russians are just making up these numbers, as far as we can tell. They've also um, issued lots of images that were photoshopped to show lots of Bradley fighting vehicles and uh, Leopard tanks damaged and, uh, in some cases, completely burned out. Undoubtedly, there have been some losses, including some Leopard tanks and some Bradley fighting vehicles. And I think that that probably arose because a concentration of them that were, were not at the front but were moving towards the front got caught by Russian Lancet UAVs. I mean, the Russians have been quite effective with their loitering mun- munitions and it looks as if they've caught one or two groups of armour waiting to go in, which is always when they're most vulnerable, of course. But in general, I think Ukrainian losses have been moderate so far. Russian losses have been, we think, higher, certainly losses in troops, but not huge losses in frontline vehicles and forces but the the russians are losing stuff in the rear areas the ukrainians have been very active with their storm shadow missiles and their own drones and they really are cutting into some of the rear area concentrations of equipment and fuel for the russians and that may make a difference when the ukrainians bring their main forces to towards the front but they haven't done that yet news discussions and analysis this is sitrap Ukraine continues to suffer from Russian airstrikes, and we've spoken before about how many of those attacks are from Iranian Shahed 136 drones, where the aircraft itself is the weapon. But this week, questions have been raised about whether British scientists have helped Iran improve that drone and other weapons. An investigation by the Jewish Chronicle found researchers at 11 UK universities have partnered with Iranian academics on studies that could be used for military applications. The Chronicle says examples include work at Imperial College, published in 2019, on possible upgrades to the lightweight engine in the Shahed. Its review of published academic papers also found work by Cranfield University, which trains many serving British military officers. The study published in 2021 was a partnership with an Iranian university on engine controllers that could improve drone maneuverability. Cranfield University told us it takes a thorough and robust approach to international collaborations and the security of our research. And it says it reviews security policies and processes on a continual basis to ensure that research activities fully comply with guidelines and legal obligations. Imperial College told the Chronicle it has robust policies and due diligence, which give national security the utmost importance. That's not been enough to allay concerns for some. Conservative MP Alicia Kearns, who chairs the Foreign Affairs Committee, called for an inquiry into what she called horrifying collaboration. Well, let's bring in Hamish de Breton Gordon, a former British tank commander who went on to lead UK efforts against chemical and biological weapons. Hamish, good to speak to you. Um, What do you make of this? Well, I think this is, on the face of it, this is an incredible story. I can think of no good reasons for British universities to be working and collaborating with Iranian universities on anything, let alone potential military projects. Now, the reason it's headline news is very much Ukraine. And as your intro says, it's Iranian drones that are doing an awful lot of damage in Ukraine. Now, British universities have been part to make sure or improve the engines on those drones. Yeah, that, that is a massive security failure. Sure, some of these reports emanate from before the Ukraine conflict. But having said that, Iran is part of the axis of evil uh, with Russia and North Korea. They have always posed a threat to the UK for some time. So the fact that British universities that are working with Iranian universities, to me, must be a security breach in some form. Now, I know universities are always after uh, money for research and collaboration, uh, as they should be. However, we do not want to work with our potential enemies and improve their military capability. And yet, Hamish, nothing about this has been kept secret, though. It's been published in academic journals with transparency about who's involved. So is there a danger of overreaction? 
Well, that's why I think we need a proper investigation to look into it, because I do agree this is published, but it, and it's taken the, the Jewish Chronicle to actually look at this and say, you know, hey, this, 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 this is something wrong here. This can't be right. We cannot be helping the Iranian government improve their drones, which are now killing innocent civilians in Ukraine and, and God knows what in the future. So it just strikes, you know, there, there's mil millions amounts of research going on all the time. And I'm sure 99.9% .9 of it is entirely appropriate and correct. Mm -hmm. However, you know, in these challenging times where, you know, threats have never been higher, uh, we need to make sure that our universities are pulling in the right direction, in the direction of where this country wants to go, not um, our potential adversaries. And as you pointed out, much, if not all, of this research would have begun before the Ukraine war. Could this be a case of hindsight is a wonderful thing? Oh, entirely. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm sure it is. You can't undo this research. But with all of these things, uh, we need to learn lessons. And I think the universities need to learn lessons. So that in future, there is, you know, I know there's, being a don at Cambridge, I know there's a lot of due diligence goes into all these sort of things. Uh, and because so much goes on, some appears to have slipped through. But it is too important, you know, just to dismiss it. We need to find out whether there is real substance to it. And if there is, put procedures in place in future to make sure that it can't happen. If there has been, Hamish, some kind of error here in judgment, um, to what extent do you think you could actually say that it is the, the government's responsibility to make sure this kind of thing does not happen? Well, well, certainly the responsibility ultimately lies with the government. Um, they are there. They set the policy and they scrutinise it uh, and they make sure that it's taken place. So um, I don't entirely blame the universities for, for what's happened or what potentially has happened. Um, both bear responsibility. So in any review, the government needs to look at uh, what its policy and procedures are and make sure that they're watertight so that uh, something like this doesn't happen in future. Hey, Mr. Bretton Gordon, thank you very much for your time. Pleasure. Well, the UK government's response to this is to say it will not accept collaborations which compromise national security and that it has expanded the scope of the academic technology approval scheme to protect UK research from ever-changing global threats. Mike, the big question here is whether sanctions have been broken or not and timing matters on that because we've introduced different sanctions on Iran at different times. Yes, we have. And so it can be difficult for universities and other organisations to decide when they're compliant with the law and we're not. But, you know, sanctions are a, a very uh, prevalent sort of diplomacy these days, partly because it's, it's, it's now conceivable to have smart sanctions. But they also cast a long shadow, particularly in a country like Iran. So a lot of people are nervous of dealing with Iran. Um, they just don't want to take on the sanctions regime in case they fall foul of it. And I remember when I was directing Rusi, we had a project at one time with some American money that was entirely innocent dealing with, you know, fellow academics to discuss stability issues in the Middle East with Iran. And the project couldn't go ahead because the Americans mm -hmm. said we will be breaking sanctions law if we put money into bringing an Iranian academic to Britain to talk about these things. The whole thing mm -hmm. sort of collapsed because of it. So it does have that deadening effect. In this particular case, it might be easy to say, even if sanctions weren't broken, what were we thinking doing business with Iran? But the flip side is science diplomacy, working together on research as a tool for soft power. Yes, I mean, academic diplomacy is very important, but I think we, we can be clear here, and I think Hamish de Bretton Gordon got it right there. He said, you know, the, the British government has specified that we have four adversaries in the world. They've written this down in defence white papers and in, in uh, defence reviews. Uh, Russia, China, North Korea and Iran, and we name them. They are our adversaries. That's the official government's word. Now, you know, if you can take, take I don't know, a country like uh, Venezuela or Cuba, uh, I mean, those are not, they're no friends of ours. They don't line up with us on anything. They don't bear any goodwill particularly but it would be a good thing to have academic exchanges with Venezuela or Cuba you know there's no no downside to that but in the case of the adversaries Russia China North Korea and Iran it would be much better if we just didn't do it at all or only did it with explicit government approval it's only four cases albeit they're big cases Russia and China mm -hmm. North Korea and Iran when North Korea we can forget about in, is a, an important country but Iran is pretty important in the Middle East they are important but it makes 
certain, a, a certain sort of sense for universities just to be very, very careful what they do with those countries. But otherwise, fine, deal with other countries you don't like us very much because that can only be a good thing. Now, holidaymakers have been warned of possible flight delays over the next week, and you'd be forgiven for wondering why that's relevant for SITREP. Well, the cause of the possible delays is NATO's largest air exercise since the end of the Cold War, which could at times fill up the airspace over Germany. There's a lot of this going on at the moment. The RAF's only just finished taking part in another very large exercise, Arctic Challenge, run from Sweden, practising offensive operations in much less congested skies over the high north. Well, Forces News reporter Hannah King is just back from Exercise Arctic Challenge. Hannah, hi. This is an exercise that happens every two years. I imagine given what's happened since the last one, its focus has been a bit different. Yes, correct, Kate. So it's been going for 10 years. This It's a big exercise. Um, this is the largest sort of European airspace uninterrupted by civilian aircraft. Um, 14 nations, 3,000 troops, 150 aircraft. But when I spoke to the exercise director for the Swedish forces, he was quite clear on the fact that this year the focus has shifted somewhat. Of course, they're doing defensive operations, but it's very much this year focused on offensive. And Hannah, what's really interesting is how you don't just get one set of allies playing the bad guys. They actually have some of the kit the potential bad guys could be using. Yeah, so there's this brilliant team that I've never come across before from RAF. They're based at RAF Spade Adam um, in Cumbria normally. They're called the Threat Emitter Team. Okay. And they have these two Soviet era surface to air missile systems, tanks, Soviet era tanks, an SA 6 and an SA 8. And so they're playing the Red Force on the ground. They sort of hide in the, in the Swedish tree lines and provide you know, good training to the, what's going on above. But it was, it was just so into the, these, these tanks originally are East German tanks. And then when Germany unified, they lent some of their equipment, some of these tanks to both the US and the UK in order to train their pilots for this for this very purpose. Um, so it's just quite, a, it's, it's, an, it's such a specialist team and they go all over the world with these two huge ancient tanks um, and they let me have a go. <laughs> Um, right, so it's similar to a so that, Nissan Micra. This, it's a clutch, <laughs> your brake and your, your accelerator. So basically you press the on button there and then you push these two together. Press start, put your foot in the accelerator. That one? That one. Okay, and it's very, very agricultural to drive these things. They're very robust. We don't often get to drive too far, but out here it's a, we can drive like five, ten kilometers which are through, the, through the Swedish countryside, which is very different for us. So that's pretty quite interesting. It's hard to explain, but you get the feel of them and you get understand the noises. And it's like 1950s, 1960s technology. So one day it worked fine, the next day it'll be broken and it will start working again. The Russians create so many switches. You'll find one switch that'll be flicked up and everything stops working. And you're thinking, what, what, was, what did that switch actually do? So, yeah. That was Corporal Aiken teaching me how to drive an SA-6. So it, it's often referred to as a tank. I've called it a tank. Technically, it's not a tank because it doesn't have a, a cannon on it. it. It's a surface-to-air missile system, but you'll hear people calling them tanks. And I can say as a farmer's daughter that it, it is, he kept saying it was quite agricultural. It is like driving a tractor. Um, <laughs> the, the, the clip in there doesn't include me asking where the steering wheel was or where my rearview mirror was, which was apparently a man <laughs> called Craig. Um, but yes, <laughs> <laughs> we were, you had fun, didn't you? We were watching your film uh, of the exercise and there's a fascinating chameleon plane involved. Just tell us about that. Oh, yeah. So I have to I have to um, take the, the, the chameleon term. That, that's entirely me. That's not what the RAF call it. But basically this aircraft is Falcon 20 um, and it's flown by civilians, but it's paid for by the RAF. And it is there to be the red force in the air, the enemy in the air. And so it jams communications, it jams radar, but it also does this really cool trick where um, from the, the pods underneath the wings, it can send out different signals, um, which the Allied aircraft pick up and translate as different aircraft. So this one plane can pretend to be lots of different enemy aircraft and, and of course, the RAF's typhoons are the central part of the UK contribution at the sharp end of the exercise. How big a contribution? Yeah, huge. Um, so they're playing in the air. They are some days playing, playing the Allied Force, the Blue Force, sometimes playing the Red Force. 
but the it was it was also useful for it was eleven fighter squadron over from RF Coningsby, and it was useful for them as well to practice this sort of concept of agile combat employment, which is something they're trying to do more of. So the the, the Swedes themselves consider themselves kind of masters of dispersed operations, so being able to operate from unfamiliar bases and um, for short periods of time with fewer people, traveling very light with less kit. And like I say, that's something eleven fighter squadron are trying to do more of as well. And I think we've got a clip now. For from squadron leader Vanilla Allery, uh, who's the senior engineering officer. Whereas in the past, Typhoon's travelled with um, a significant amount more spares and um, equipment than what we've brought with us. We have, in some respects, with tooling, quite literally raided our own squadron um, and just brought sort of the minimum amount of tooling. We have a handful of spares um, and a very small amount of GSE. So the footprint of this whole deployed exercise has been really, really small, um, just to try and prove that concept of ACE. And that will make you more agile, but presumably Absolutely. makes it a little bit more concerning for you or makes your job a little bit more difficult? Uh, there's definitely some stress knowing that we haven't got as many spares as what we might have had in the past. But it just means we have to be, I guess, a little more creative in terms of knowing what we can and can't do and uh, using our engineering latitude to the fullest extent. That was um, squadron leader Fenella Allery, um, who I think she she explained uh, everything's on her head engineering wise. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Hannah, uh, Sweden was hosting, still waiting to join NATO. What does the exercise and Britain's contribution mean to them? Oh, huge. I mean, I should say as well, whilst we were there, Secretary of State Antony Blinken and the Swedish Prime Minister held a press conference and they didn't, uh, obviously didn't actually make any announcements, it's not within their um, their gift to, but they were very much speaking as if it was kind of a, you know, a bit of a foregone conclusion. Blinken sort of said, you know, Turkey and Hungary raised legitimate concerns and that Sweden have addressed them and now it's time to move forward. So, but in terms of our, Britain's contribution, they they were just thrilled to have us. They were great hosts. They really valued our experience, and you know not just the um, the the Allied forces we were we were training with, but also um, the guys on the ground playing the Red Force um, from Spade Adam. Spring came very late to Sweden, and they had a bit of a, a, a an issue because there was too much snow to put their mm. tanks uh, where they wanted to. So they were sort of knocking on people's doors asking if they could park a Soviet era tank in their garden, <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they were all thrilled. And very happy to help. So yeah, I think the whole of Sweden we're pleased to have us there. Sounds like everyone had a ball. Hannah King, thank you so much. And if you want to see the exercise in action and Hannah learning the difference between a tank and Nissan Micra, her film is on the Forces News YouTube channel now. Uh, Mike, um, we've got NATO troops exercising, another meeting of NATO ministers happening in Brussels. This feels like a dance that's been going on for more than a year with no end in sight. But is it making any difference? Oh, yes, it is, um, because what's happening, I mean, all this is the, the nitty gritty of a sort of a new Europe that's fallen into place in the last year because of the Russian invasion. And that new Europe is, is like the old Europe used to be in the 1950s. And so you've got NATO being very vigorous and, and really now quite potent militarily. You've got the European Union um, at, exercising its economic muscle and its political muscle to a reasonable extent, quite a good extent. And then the United States acting as a great transatlantic leader um, and pulling everybody else along with Britain playing its traditional role and France and Germany emerging into their roles. I mean, this all looks almost too good to be true. Um, I mean, the questions are how solid is it and how long will it last? And there is, a, a, I, th I guess, for people like me, a, a sort of sense of unease that if it, if it looks too good to be true, it may be good, too good to mm. be true. Um, but for now, this is all the sort of Europe that we wanted to see. This is the security architecture of the West. Now, that itself, um, in itself, is not going to win the war for Ukraine. Ukraine is not a member of the EU or, or of NATO. But my goodness, it does not make look Europe different in response to this egregious breaking of international law in the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Professor Michael Clark, great to speak to you. Thank you so much. And my thanks to all of our guests. That's all for now. We'll be back with another SITREP next Thursday. If you want to listen online, you can now find us on the Forces News YouTube channel, as well as our home at bfbs.com slash SITREP or wherever you download your podcasts. For now, though, from me, Kate Chabot, thank you for listening. Bye-bye. <laughs> 